Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Yolanda, an alcoholic. And I want to thank the people, my friends from Hollister, for coming down. That's really special. And I want to thank Saturday Night Live for inviting me to um, do this speaker meeting. That's really an honor. And um, Saturday Night Live is my home group. Um, because of Saturday Night Live and um, the, the spirituality and the friendship and love I found here, I have nine and a half years today. Yeah. And qualifying myself, you know, talking about your stories as time goes on, it's almost like you can't see that. In the beginning of my sobriety, I could, I almost relived my past on a daily basis all the time. It was like present there. And now it's not. It's like it's an entirely different person. And I think that's where, it's, that's a good thing for me. I don't want to um, be that person that I came in here as. And um, in order to do that, I have to do a few simple things. And most of those are right here. And they're in this, um, the blue book, which is the, our big book, and the 12 by 12. That's not the 12 by 12. Anyway, the 12 by 12. And this is where I learned how to be the person that I am today. I didn't um, come here having any skills. I didn't come here because I just thought, woke up one day and said, gee, I think I'll join AA. This, um, for me, was literally the last house on the block. I um, I hit a bottom that only you can individually can hit. You know, sometimes... People learn from getting arrested the first time. Others learn by, um, you know, something bad happening. It's the three uh, characters that they they talk about in the big book. You know, the people that can stop because something happens in their family. They can, um, there's three types. I'm the classic alcoholic. I could not stop. I definitely needed help. And even though I went to many psychologists, psychiatrists, and counselors, um, that wasn't the kind of help that worked for me. You know, I needed to talk to another alcoholic addict. And my story, for those who may be offended, includes drugs because that's what it was in my era and that's what it is in most people's life. But my drug of choice was alcohol because when all was said and done, that's where I went. So um, to qualify myself, um, this is a really hairy story, and uh, but the sequel is really good. <laughs> it's like a horror story. and uh, And unfortunately, it's my story. And, um, but I really like that no matter, I are, I've already been to hell, you know, I'm not in hell anymore. I know what it's like to have peace in my life. I know what, what serenity is all about. And I learned that by doing the steps and, um, doing the inventories and doing, um, the eighth and ninth step, which means making amends to people. And a lot of stuff was lifted for me because what I learned as a child was to stop feeling. So what do you do with all that stuff? I stuffed a lot of things as time went on, and it took me a long time to, and here you hear about um, more shall be revealed. And that's exactly the way it was. God never gives you more than you can handle at any time, I believe. And that's one thing I want to clarify is however I translate this book, however I tell my story, however I do, it's mine. It's just how I do it. Everybody you know, deciphers this this program in their own way, and that's the good thing. That's the great thing about it. You can have your own God, the Gucci God, whatever it is for you. And, uh, you know, nobody makes you do anything. These are suggested. And if you don't want to do them, then you're welcome to your own misery. All I can tell you is that I came in here, started coming to Alcoholics Anonymous in 1984, and I didn't get it. I couldn't talk to anybody. I couldn't... Um, I couldn't tell you I needed help. I was a survivor. I could do it by myself. Thank you very much. And what I found as time went on is that I wasn't doing it very well. I kept going to jail. I kept losing jobs. I kept pretty soon at the end, I was sleeping on my daughter's floor. That's how well I was handling myself. So there's step one. My life was totally unmanageable. And towards the end, it was like I was just holding on to the times in between I, I wasn't drinking. But when I, I had to do what I had to do, and then all hell was, you know, it, it was a disaster every time. 
You know, I, I mentioned Monday when I chaired <laughs> that, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about the good times and stuff. And, you know, my drinking didn't start off that way. It was bad all the time. And you think somewhere I would have gotten a clue that maybe this was not what I should be doing. But I really, truly believe I knew no other way. And what Alcoholics Anonymous gave me is another way. It showed me that I didn't, that I did have choices. And I really thought I was destined to live the same life my mother had led. I really thought that I was destined to be just miserable in my own skin forever. And when I saw other people here and I, and I watched them before I could do anything, I watched other people get better. So then the second phase comes in, and that's when your mind tells you, but you, not for you. Everybody else it's going to work for, but you're going to be that exception. Because, you know, you always try to make yourself a part away from the regular people. I was never a part of anything. I was always a loner. I always stayed in my own stuff. And uh, that way, I didn't get hurt. That way, I didn't have to hurt you. And um, it was just safer that way. But what I was doing is I was slowly dying inside, too. When your heart is so closed and so cold that you can't feel anymore, what is life? What quality of life is that? And I truly shut feelings off so that I wouldn't be hurt anymore. And those feelings started when I was really young. You know, my mother, like I said, she was an alcoholic. She doesn't drink today. She did do Alcoholics Anonymous for about seven years. She said, this shit doesn't work, but she's still not drinking. So maybe it, something, something worked there. Um, and I remember when she told me that, I was so excited because I thought we could finally have some kind of connection. And then she said, that shit doesn't work. And I was just devastated. It's like, <laughs> So anyway, um, I was uh, an unwanted child, and uh, my mother gave me up for adoption, and um, my grandparents said, we don't give our children away, they're Catholic, so <laughs> they didn't believe in giving their children away, so they adopted me. And they didn't adopt me legally, what they did is they just took me over, and um, so I lived with them for uh, a while, and... Um, I was really, I was, I was young, so I don't know. All I know is what I've heard in that part. And that part was that I kept going back and forth to my mother, to my grandparents, to my aunt. And I was just going from house to house. Finally, I settled in with my grandmother and grandfather for a while. And um, one day they were, said, we're, we're going to take you to your mother. Well, along the way, my grandmother forgot to tell, forgot that she told me my mother was dead. So I'm wondering, what mother? I don't, you know, what? Who? I mean, they don't, they didn't believe in explanations to children when they, in, in my day, you know, nobody told you the whole thing. You just picked your little suitcase up and we're going. So what happened is they brought me to Chicago and, uh, that's where my mother lived. She was married, married and she had a little boy. And, um, she coaxed me into believing that she really wanted me there and that, um, <clears throat> showed me a, a Sears catalog where the mother and daughter dressed alike and, and I wanted this love for my mom so bad that I was, I went gung ho. Well, what happened for me was that, um, I went there and what I really was was a nanny. You know, it was like this little Cinderella story. I, I was put in this little tiny room and I remember this room faced out into the main street and I used to just sit there and cry, cry and wonder, why me? Why does all this shit have to happen to me? I didn't ask to be born. I didn't ask to be here. And that was one of my, violin tunes for a long time you know why me and so um I used to sit there and cry all the time and wonder you know why can't I go home to my grandparents and um my my mother and stepfather were both alcoholics so what happened is their life just took off now they had some freedom because although I didn't know how to do a lot of stuff what I was is smart and I learned how to do a lot of stuff quickly so that if I was good I wouldn't get hurt and um they drank and used a lot, and um, there was a lot of fights and a lot. Of, and for some reason, you know, I've always been the protector. And so I'd stand there in front of my mom, don't hit her, and get nailed every time. And um, that went on for a long time. And then finally, um, they decided to get a divorce. But in the meantime, uh, another little baby was born. It's my little sister. And so now I had two kids to take care of. And I was like nine years old. And I'd come from an environment where I was like Shirley Temple. You know, I wore all these little frilly dresses and my hair was in banana curls and I never had to do shit. So all of a sudden I went from that to an environment where I had to cook, clean, wash, 
change dirty diapers, and just do literally everything. And so I, um, they got a divorce, and what happened for my mother is that her, her disease took off. She became a full-blown alcoholic, and uh, most of the time we were just glad she was out of the house because when she was home and she wasn't drinking, it was miserable. So about um, six months after she got divorced, um, she came home really late one night and um, put a bottle of, of uh, whiskey on the table and says, I want to talk to you. We're going to drink. Okay, so we sat, I sat down. Here's a 10-year-old sitting at the kitchen table with her mom with a pack of Winstons and some whiskey, and she's going to talk. We're going to talk. And you know what? I didn't think that was weird. I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. And I look at my 10-year-old grandson today and think, oh, my God, I was 10 years old. And I look at him, and I can't even fathom you know, that happening to a 10-year-old, but that's what we did. And when my, the only time my mother ever could show affection was when she was drunk. She would say, yeah, I love you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. And you know what? That, that, I knew that, and, and it didn't matter how she said it as long as she said it. You know, it was the attention. You know, it doesn't matter what kind of attention you're getting as long as you're getting some kind of attention, bad or good. So... um what I felt at that point was that um, there was something that calmed down in me. You know, I didn't feel beautiful. I didn't feel like the world was wonderful. I just felt like, whew, okay, I can handle this. And um, that's when I started drinking. I started drinking realizing that there was something that changed inside of me. This liquid did something for me. You know, that nervousness, that anxiety that most of us experience, that um, pacing and, and uh, unable to sleep. If you look at pictures of me as a little girl, I always had big bags in them, under my eyes. I could hardly ever sleep. And so I realized that though that whiskey did something. So um, when she would leave, I would start drinking. And, you know, I said this at the meeting earlier is that... Um, you know, I, I knew how to fill the bottles with water. I knew how to mark them so that before and after where you start, so how much would be there. I knew all these things. How did I know that? Who taught me this thing? My grandparents didn't even drink, yet I knew how to do all this stuff. So I started um, drinking there, and um, my mother got worse and worse and worse. We hardly ever went to school. We were truant a lot, and, um, you know, sometimes she would leave from Friday and not come home until Monday, just enough to get dressed and go to work. And, um, you know, I used to cry all the time. I wanted to go home. I wanted my grandparents. I wanted, you know, somebody to, to care for me instead of me always having to care for people. And then after a while, it just became, I just became mom. I just became the mother of these two children. And um, I did that for a long time. And finally, my mom couldn't handle it no more, and we... Um, she brought us to California, thank God, because my grandparents were here. So she bought her three kids, dumped them off here, and she went off to Wisconsin. I never knew who was in Wisconsin, but that's where she went. So my grandparents immediately took me to juvenile, I mean, to the court, and um, asked the court to um, allow me to stay with them. And it was funny, because after my grandfather passed away, I found that paper that the courts allowed me to go live with my grandparents. And um, what happened was that they, um, my mother never even showed up for the hearing. So shortly after that, my um, stepbrother and sister, their father came down and uh, took them away. And, you know, that was the beginning of my shutting down for, no, I mean, these were my kids. And, you know, five and ten years old. And, um, and they were gone just like that. Nobody asked me, nobody consulted to me, nobody explained to me anything. They just took those kids, and, and, and I was alone for the first time in a long, long time. And so I went to school, started going to school here, and, you know, the depression was really, I realize now, I never even knew what depression was. And I realize now that um, I went into this really, really deep depression where all I would do is stay in my room. And uh, I had this teacher, Dr., I mean, um, Mrs., uh, Burbank that taught me about reading. So once I learned to live in this reading world, that's where I stayed. I stayed in books all the time. And um, and I was at my grandparents' house. Now here's the opportunity for me to go a different way. I had grandparents. There was nobody home anymore. It was just me. I was spoiled rotten by them. I had literally 
the ability to do anything I wanted. They really trusted me, and all I wanted to do was get high. You know, it wasn't the environment. That's what I can see today. It's only in hindsight that you get to see this stuff. It wasn't the environment. I was an alcoholic, and it wouldn't have mattered where I was. I was going to drink. I was going to find those people. I was going to find that stuff. So I started going to school here. I went to Hoover, uh, Hester School, and I think I was there from the fifth, sixth, fifth and sixth grade, and that was pretty normal. Um, because my grandparents didn't have anything to drink, when I would go over other people's houses, I would look in their cabinets, I would do stuff like that. So I'd always find something somewhere. But I maintained it for a long time because they were so they were very religious and very good people. And um, so I stayed that way for a long time. And then um, seventh grade came along, and I found a whole new group of people. And these were, you know, the bad kids, the hippies. And um, what happened for me is that I started, um, my, my disease took off. So junior high school, I started um, smoking and using and drinking. I remember the first time I... Uh, I went out with my friend Lindy, and we were supposed to go to this dance and then come home. Well, um, I, I didn't want Lindy to get drunk, so I'm the one that got drunk. And I remember my grandmother dragging me in the house, saying, you're drunk. And I'm saying, no, I'm not. And, you know, I'm just a wreck. And so what happened, my grandparents grounded me for a year, you know. <laughs> and um, I couldn't go anywhere without my aunt. Well, my aunt wasn't anything like me, and so just to get out of the house, she would go to Mexican dances and stuff, so I would go just to go. And pretty soon, if I pouted long enough and hard enough, I knew my grandfather would get it, give in. So um, he gave in, and, and I started running and using, and I got tattoos, and I pierced people's ears, and we were selling and panhandling and just stuff that every normal kid does, right? Every normal alcoholic kid. Um, high, junior high school wasn't too bad. I could still maintain, and uh, I got in that one scrape. And then by the, I think, yeah, it was the ninth grade. Uh, the summer of the eighth grade, I met um, David. I met him at the bowling alley, and that's where Fiesta Lanes, where we all hung out. And uh, we used to, like, sharpen pencils and clean scorecards to play pool. And that's where I hung out. Every day I would make an excuse to get there and just spend a little time there. So anyway, David was selling stuff, so we ended up getting loaded. And, um, you know, we ended up going out. And um, what happened is that we ended up married. And I was married when I was um, 16 years old. And uh, I had to go before the uh, uh, board, the school board, and they wanted to know. They were, they were going to decide if I was going to be able to come back to school. Because they didn't think it was right for a married person of 16 to be going to junior high school. So I went to the, before the board, and they asked me all kinds of questions. And mostly I told them, it's none of your business. You know, whatever I do is, in my private life is not anything that's going to be happening in school. So they allowed me to go back to school. And um, so then I, I, I had a party house, right? I mean, I was the one with the car. I could buy booze. And um, I always had stuff going on at my house. We uh, did a lot of using and drinking, and if we couldn't maintain, I'd just go home because I could. And um, everything was still kind of okay. I wasn't getting in trouble. I wasn't um, – I couldn't get in trouble anymore. Who's going to – you know, they report me to my husband. It, it, it just – the whole – it was just like this whole thing changed. So I graduated from um, junior high school, got into high school, and then stuff started to happen. I, um, I was now emancipated, and um, I got stopped one time, the first time, and it was me and my brother-in-law and one of his friends. We were downtown First Street, and uh, I guess I wasn't driving very well. And they pulled me over, and they found some drugs, and um, they found that we had bottles in the car, and... and um, you know, they went to take a urine test, and I filled it with water, so they couldn't really get me for anything. It ended up to be an unsafe lane change, but it was a felony. And what happened is that that was my first visit to Elmwood, and I was in the felony ward. And still, I didn't think there was anything wrong with this. You know, I just, oh, well, I'll get out of this. You know, there's just, it just like was part of the program. I was supposed to, my mother went to jail. 
but my grandparents didn't go to jail. But what, you know, I mean, my mother's an alcoholic. I followed that path. And I, I, um, I went into jail and there was this lady that took me under her wings so nobody would hurt me. And, you know, I just, I just didn't feel like I didn't belong there. So time goes on and I get out of that. And pretty soon, um, I'm getting arrested again for drunk driving. And I don't know what it is about drunk driving, but once you get one, <laughs> for me, I just kept getting them. And um, I kept wrecking cars, and I kept um, just doing those things that we do. Uh, right, after, right out of high school, I, um, I also had my daughter when I was in high school. I took off for, I think it was my uh, junior year, and I went to the Y, and I did my schooling there until after my daughter was born, and then I went back to high school. So through high school and through junior high, I was an, a, a, an adult. You know, I wasn't, I didn't get to do, I didn't go to any proms. I didn't go to my senior prom. I didn't go to any of these dances. I didn't get to do the things that normal teenagers should do because I was already so big and so streetwise that that just didn't even feel like something I wanted to do. I, did, I grew up way too fast. I was an adult way too fast. And if anything, I could say to kids now, just stay young. You know, they're so in a hurry to get to 18 and then to 21, and then it's all downhill. They don't understand that, though. Uh, so I had my daughter, and before my daughter, um, I, had, I was pregnant with another child, and my husband and I decided that we couldn't keep that child, that we were just not ready. Well, having that abortion almost killed me, and um, I didn't want to do that, but I could I didn't know how to not do that, because if he said, I didn't have any boundaries, and I didn't know how to stand up for myself, and I really thought, okay, this it's better for that child not to come into this kind of relationship where her father and I are, are beating each other up all the time, and the kind of life we led, you know, chasing, uh, you know, somebody who stole drugs from us down Las Gadas Boulevard and doing stuff like that. It was not a very good environment for a child. So we decided it wasn't, and then um, I hated him for that after. But it wasn't his fault. It was my it was my body. It was me. So I, uh, I really started using really heavy after that. And then shortly after, I got pregnant again, and I said, don't even think about it. You know, I couldn't do that again. So I had this child, I was still in school, and um, we were just doing what we were doing. You know, I, start, I didn't use during the pregnancy, but as soon as I was done being pregnant, I, went, I started using and drinking again. Well, that didn't work very long in our relationship, and pretty soon we hated each other with a passion, and we needed to get away from each other, so we did. And um, what happened is David took my, took my daughter away from me for a while, and um, he was, uh, he was, worked for Los Gatos Mental Health and Drug Abuse, and uh, we used to go do drugs at his place. <laughs> we used to do this thing in high school, it was a rap group, where everybody sat around and talked out things, and he used to be the leader of that thing, and he was higher than a kite. You know, he did a lot of things behind that uh, title, and uh, so David and I ended up just getting a divorce, but he took my daughter, and... Um, you know, something happened inside of me, and I didn't want, you know, when I became a mother, I really t wanted to be a good mother. I really wanted to love this child, and I really wanted not to do to her what my mother had done to me. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. I didn't have the tools to, have, to, to bring up a child. I didn't know how to be nurturing. I didn't know how to nurture myself. How could I nurture a child? So I, um, he took her away from me, and what I did is I went and I got a job. And in the 70s, early 70s, there was a lot of electronics around here and a lot of electronic jobs. So I didn't know what I was doing. Somebody said they're hiring at National Semiconductor. I knew nothing about semiconductors, nothing. I went into this job, and uh, Dan Mc was the inter was my boss. And, well, he interviewed me, and I said, look, I don't know what you're doing here, and I don't care. I need a job. I need to get my daughter back, and I, I'm very smart, and I'll work really hard. He said, you start tomorrow. And uh, in 1972, and I've been working electronics ever since. And uh, these, I worked at, La at National Semiconductor, and it was just a bunch of high school kids, all out of high school, doing these um, integrated circuits. 
and everybody was using, everybody was drinking. It was just a madhouse there. The engineers were buying and selling, and, and security, the trailer, was always something going on there. And what Marchetti's was kitty corner to National Semiconductor. So we'd go first break, we'd hit Marchetti's. Lunchtime, we'd hit Marchetti's. Second break, we'd hit Marchetti's. And then after work, we'd hit Marchetti's. And then if, the, if Marchetti's got boring, then we'd go to another neighborhood bar. So all we did really was hang out in the bars there. And the more people you took, and if you took your boss, you could stay longer. So um, one day, and I think I, I mentioned this at, on the Monday meeting, is, um, you know, for some reason I, find, I found it necessary to take all these pills at lunchtime. And they just didn't, weren't working. I thought, I've got, you know, these are bad. They're not working or nothing. So I took some more pills had a couple of black Russians, and uh, proceeded to go back to work. And what happened is that I uh, I passed out at my station. And they carried me out and put me in my car. And um, I'm not a really nice person when I I'm, I'm get up from being loaded. So I'm standing in the parking lot screaming, give me my effing keys. Who's got my effing keys? So they call the, the supervisor down. He said, yo, you can't drive like this. I said, what are you talking about? I'm fine. So I said, Dan, give me my keys. So since Dan was drinking with us and he knew that, you know, he could get in trouble too, he gave me my keys and I took off. And I came to work the next day like nothing happened. Nobody said anything to me. Nobody did nothing. It was just I just went to my station and started working. And we were allowed to do that. It was like it was no big deal. People fell down the stairs. You know, I remember the uh, Channel 11 News being there one time. This guy and his girlfriend had split up, and he was going to shoot himself, and uh, another guy was going to drink sulfuric. And, you know, I mean, this stuff was just like normal stuff. So my whole life, or everywhere around me, was this chaos all the time. Uh, I continued working, and then I got my daughter back. And what I did is I got her back, and I got in a babysitter that would come to the house, and on Friday nights the babysitter would take my daughter home so I could go do whatever it was I needed to do. So once I learned how to have money and how to take care of myself, things became a lot easier. Then I was in charge. Then I was in control. And um, for alcoholics, you know what that means. I'm in control of everything. And... Um, my daughter's getting bigger. She's getting more aware of what's going on, and I'm trying to hide things more. I start getting arrested a lot more, and um, it wasn't good. You know, I worked for a while. You can just see the progression of my disease. My first job was like five, no, it was like six years. My second job was five years, and then it's one and two, one and two, one and two. You know, I'd get pissed off, say, F you, I'm out of here, walk across the street and get another job. You could do that then. You can't do that today. It takes you months to get a job. But um, in the process, getting arrested, and then I started getting little slips. And in 1984, I came to Alcohol Alcoholics Anonymous in Sunnyvale for the first time on my own. And I really, really wanted to change things. I was so sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was tired of the arrests. I was tired of the drunks. I was tired of... Everything of being sick all the time. I remember, I remember being sick and then trying to get all the poison out of my body and going running and being dizzy and uh, oh, just this vicious cycle of trying to get well and then drinking and trying to get well again and being so sick that I couldn't get out of bed or couldn't get off the couch. It, it was just a vicious cycle and I still didn't get it that there was something wrong with me, that this disease was killing me, that there was a way out. In 84, I hit Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd heard about it from my mom, and um, I don't know what um, central office. I remember um, hearing from somewhere that you could call central office. So um, I went to Sunnyvale, and, um, you know, the women were all there. I mean, they gave me phone numbers. I still have the same book from that, that time, first time I went there, and there's phone numbers in there. And I was just so proud that I couldn't ask for help. And not being able to ask for help kept me out there a lot longer. What I suggest to newcomers today and what I always suggest to my sponsors is take your pride and ego and stick it in a closet for a year. Give this program a full year. Work it like it should be worked 
And if you're still not happy by the end of the year, your misery is still there. Take your pride and ego back. But for me, I know that my ego kept me out a lot longer because I couldn't ask for help. I couldn't ask you to help me. I couldn't say, I need you. I figured I can do this on my own. I read the books, you know, but reading the books isn't all of it. It's a combination. There's a recipe here. It's the book, The Power of the People. It, we got to have all three in order to make a, have a life that's worth living. So um, I start handing in papers and, you know, signing them myself, having other people sign them, doing all this crazy stuff. And um, when I went there on my own, I really, truly wanted help. And I remember looking up at the person who was sharing that day and thinking, they pay that person to get up there, you know. That person, you know, they were too, they were happy, and they were, you know, their eyes were clear. And I'm thinking, yeah, like they've ever drank before in their lives. You know, I wonder what actor this is. And it wasn't an actor, and I know that today, but, I mean, I found out shortly after that. But I really believe that you guys paid somebody to come up here. And let me tell you about happy people. I hated happy people so much. There was this... um supervisor I had when I worked for Advanced Micro Devices. And I hated this man. He was so happy. He was just bubbly and just wanted to come in and have Hawaiian Day and do all these things. And I just thought, you know, I want to make him miserable. It was like I made it my goal to make him miserable. And I did. I made him so mad. We were standing in his office and he was pissed off at me because one more time, yo, took an hour and a half for lunch. So I was pretty well lit by the time I came back, and that's when I was working swing shift. And um, so I said, so what, Gary? What, you know, what, what are you going to do? And, and so we start this battering back and forth. Pretty soon I'm telling him to screw himself. And um, and I see him getting madder and madder and tenser, and pretty soon his, his, he forms fists. And I said, come on, let's do it. You know, I wanted him to to throw that punch so, so he could get fired and get the hell out of it. Because I wasn't going to throw it, but I know if, if he did, he would. whoever hits first is the one that gets fired. So I really wanted, I stirred all that up so that he would be miserable. That's horrible. Because he was so happy and I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand that he was happy. And you know what? I, were, I started working for VLSI in 1992. No, 97 or 6, whatever. And Gary was there. And I didn't get an interview. They hired me without an interview, without anything. And so I asked the manager later, I said, how did I get in here without an interview? He said, Gary had told them that, you know, Yolanda taught him everything he knew in electronics. And this is a man that I had, was standing toe-to-toe with wanting him to hit me. And later on, the phone rang in the fab area, and I answered it, and it was Gary. And I said, Gary, I just want to tell you that, you know, I made amends to him, and he said, Yolanda, I don't know what you're doing, but I really like the way you carry yourself today. You know, those are God things. You know, I got the opportunity to make amends to him, and I and I took it. And, you know, no, he didn't go around telling everybody what, what happened. He was truly a nice guy, and I could appreciate him after. And it was really funny that shortly, about four months after that, he came up and asked me, he says, you know, I know you don't drink anymore, and I want to know how you do that. Gary was an alcoholic, but he was trying to find the program. So it was truly a miracle that this whole thing came around. But I'll tell you, he could have he could have stopped that um, stopped me in my tracks right there by telling them what what I'd done, and he never did. So that was how I felt about happy people. I just really didn't like him, and I wanted him out out of my way. And <clears throat> so you know, if you're a newcomer and you don't like all these people that are smiling and wandering around, I understand. I really do. Because I didn't like him either. But you know what? It's not that um, you can't have that too. You know, I worked at it. And some people don't have to work as hard as others. Some people just get it. And you know, I used to hate them too. I I had to work harder. You know, I really, this is one of my own little beliefs. Is that, you know, I believe sometimes the longer you drink, the harder it is to just let that shit go. So it really took me some work. There were times in the beginning where all I could do was sit on my bed because I was afraid to go out the door because I was afraid that my car would go to that bar. I was afraid that, you know, I would just casually walk up to 7-Eleven where they have booze. 
You know, I mean, I really knew in the beginning I had I had all this fear. And the fear was of going back to the life that I had before. I really didn't want to do that. So I started um, <clears throat> going to AA, and I just couldn't get it. And what I know today is that I wasn't ready. You know, I had to drink every drink. I had to drop every pill. I had to go to every jail I ever had to go to. I had to do all those things in order to get here, in order to be who I am today. There was just no shortcuts, and there isn't. If you're here and you need to go drink, go drink. You, when you're done, you'll know. When I came here in uh, on July 26, 1992, to a woman's meeting at 3 o'clock, I knew I was done because I could hear what that woman up there was saying. And I had never been able to do that before. It was like, you know, when you read the big book and you're reading between the lines and nothing makes any sense to you, this time people started to make sense. I started to realize that they were like me, that they felt what I felt inside. And I, have never, I had never experienced that before. I thought I was always different. I thought that they were always better. I had no self-esteem. I had no, I had no skills. The skills to talk were nil, believe me. The entire vocabulary consisted of, hey, what's up? That was all I could say. Because I was so afraid of you. And when I came in that last time, after all the alcohol programs, after all the DUIs, after all, after all, after all, I could finally hear. And what I did different then is I started to participate in my sobriety. You know, I joined the little things that they have in, in all the meetings. You know, every meeting has their own picnics. They have their own um, <clears throat> business meetings. They have their own secretaries. They have their own stuff. And what I started to do is participate in that. They told me to get a sponsor. I got a sponsor. They told me I had to work with that sponsor. I worked with that sponsor. I did the steps. And um, my life started to change. It started to tra change dramatically. And it was two months after I got here that my daughter called me and asked me to take her to a meeting. And I was just, you know, I had to play it off, of course, you know, because I just kept. I said, yeah, well, I guess I can pick you up. And I'm all, yes. Because, you know, I wanted her here, but what I knew was that if I told her to come here, like any parent, don't be telling your kids to come here. Be an example. It's, it's the, a program of attraction. It truly is. And what my daughter saw in me was that I was smiling, and that didn't happen very often. She noticed that, you know what, I didn't scream and holler. She noticed there was a difference. And the difference was is that I could hear, and I, you know, I, I, I explained what was going on here. I didn't use names. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't make her drag her here. I just brought her here because she wanted to see what was happening to me. So she came here, and she did her own thing for a long time. And um, there was nothing I could do. But, and that's when um, el was very useful because I had to let go. I had to let go. I sponsored my daughter for a while, and that was not good. That was really not good. It was okay up until step four and five, and then it was kind of, I don't want to hear my story. So um, I sponsored her for a while, and my daughter just had to make her own way here. I couldn't do it for her. And you know what? There is no parent. There are a lot of parents and husbands that want to fix their spouses or fix their kids. You can't do it. They need to find their own way. All you can do is be an example. And if you're here and you're working and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, they will see that. And they might not see it right away, but they'll always know that they have a place to go. So um, my daughter and I were living together when we started this journey here in Campbell. And uh, we both used to go to El Paseo. And it was wonderful. You know, Saturday Night Live to me is like my refuge. It's like my church. It truly is. You know, I never came here loaded. Actually, I never came to any meetings loaded, even in Sunnyvale. I wouldn't drink that day. Not to say I wouldn't drink after, but until that time was over, I would really try not to drink because this place just had something. And I don't care how corny that sounds. It sounded corny to me, too. I used to hear everybody at that time say everything was awesome. Oh, I was sick of awesome, I'll tell you. You know, and they, all these little sayings that they have, think, 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 and live and let live, and all these things, I, I didn't understand what they were talking about. And it wasn't until I read the big book, and I started going to meetings, and I started hanging around with the women, 
And I started sponsoring people that I really started to understand what this program was about. You know, we can sit here in this room and we can all be hella spiritual. You know, but it's out there. It's out there when somebody cuts you off. It's out there when you're pissed off at your old lady or your old man. It's, it's out there when, you know, somebody, uh, the clerk isn't fast enough. That's where we're supposed to use this stuff. You know, it's not for society to learn how to live with the alcoholic. It's for the alcoholic to learn how to live in society. And that means to practice these principles in all your affairs. And that hasn't been easy. I mean, I, I work for the woman from hell. You know, I, I've had a lot of, I've done these steps on my boss. Because <clears throat> I'm not very good at taking direction from other people. And um, I finally realized that Sandra represents something about my mom in me, you know, with me. So there was this clash, and we kept clashing and clashing. And then I found out that Sandra's youngest daughter is an alcoholic. And guess who sponsored Sandra for a while? You know, she came to me a lot. And um, I, I um, lent her a lot of tapes from AA. I bought her a book, and although she, she just wanted to try to understand the alcoholic, she picked up some of the principles here, and I hear her using some of our little sayings, because I use them all the time, and um, that that's a direct result of me knowing this program, of me working in these books, of me working with others, knowing that, you know what, I didn't have, now it wasn't that I had anything over Sandra, because, you know, I knew about her daughter, it was that she needed something and it, I was the alcoholic, and I was carrying that message, even if it wasn't to another alcoholic. Um, Sandra's taking her daughter to meetings. You know, there's a lot of uh, stuff. There's a lot of people um, that I know from from the fellowship that are at my work, you know, and that's it's really wonderful because if stuff goes down, I can go into their office or we can walk around the building and talk. You know, I learned that I don't share my stuff with normies because I really don't give a shit. And people don't understand the way we vent. They just don't. You know, when I'm venting and I'm um, trying to unload whatever is inside of me, what happens is that I truly am feeling those feelings as if it's just happened. I'm just as angry, and I'm just venting. And what I'm venting is trying to get it out, because I, I believe that um, by sharing it, you take the power out of it. If you can get it out, if you can share it with another human being, then you take that power out of it. And pretty soon, it's like, wow, that's not such a big deal. So I, I picked up a lot of little tricks along the way. I remember listening to this guy, and this was something I used for a long time. And it may sound weird, and oh, well, it's my story. Um, I remember hearing this guy say that he used to, um, he had an international committee just like mine. I used to have this committee that was in my head all the time that was just there, constantly pulling me in different directions. And he told me that what he used to do is he used to pull over on the freeway, open the door, and tell them all to get the hell out. I said, okay, I could do that because I'm a visual kind of person. I really need that, okay, opening the – and I used to do that. When I when things were – I'd open my front door, tell them all to get out. Just get out. I don't want anybody here today. You know, I did a lot of little weird things – they told me that I had to, to learn to love myself here. What the hell does that mean? I didn't know I needed to love myself. I didn't know how to love myself. I took care of myself. I took a bath. I took a shower. You know, I took combed my hair. Well, I tried. You know, I did the things I thought I was supposed to do. But the nurturing that you give yourself, I had no clue. I had no clue how to love me. So my sponsor told me, do affirmations. Put a little sticky on your mirror and say, I love you, yo. And I would say, I love you, yo, I love you, yo. I could not look in the mirror for the longest time. I couldn't look in the mirror and say, I love you, yo. And time went on, and I started sponsoring women, and I learned how to nurture a woman, uh, how to be there for her. I learned how to be a friend. I learned how to be a mother. I learned how to be a grandmother. And I learned these things here by watching other people. I am who I am today because you guys told me that I can take pieces from every each and every one of you and incorporate it and be one and I did that I took this from her and this from him and all the parts I liked and I got to be me I built me and when I built the person I wanted I could look in the mirror and say I love you and you guys were still here through all that stuff I remember my sponsors throwing me birthday parties and just going oh my god you know the balloons and you know just hugs and stuff and it just felt all wrong. 
and I was able to give it, but I wasn't able to receive it. And I kept just sitting there. Sometimes I would just have to sit on my hands just to get through this kind of stuff. And Because I couldn't open my heart because I kept believing that, you know, if I open my heart to people, I'm going to get hurt. You know, they're going to screw me some way. And I had to let all that shit go because it doesn't matter. As long as I'm okay with me, I'm okay. I can be, no matter, and I tell this to my girls all the time, with or without anybody, you've got to be okay. If everybody leaves you today, you have to be okay. Because if we're not, we will die. I can't put it any plainer than that. You need to be number one in your program. You have to practice these 10 steps, 12 steps. I shut it, turned it down. If you don't, if you make a goal list of 10 goals and your number one goal is not you in your sobriety, count the other nine out. They will not happen. Because you know what? We are just always a slip away all the time. You know, we're just... It could happen, you know, I've, I've, I've heard, heard people say how they, um, I'm always curious when people go out, like, what did they do? What didn't they do? How did that happen? Why did it happen? I can't ask them, but, you know, I kind of make my own little surveys as to what went on. And most of the time, it's something that they're not doing. And they have to figure that out. You know, we can't, I can't tell my sponsees why they can, you know, to do something and this will absolutely work. I will tell you this, there is no manual for sponsors. We do not have a manual. You know, you do the best you can. It's like raising a kid. Once you get past the, you know, Dr. Spock, is that the guy? That you, yeah. Okay, once you get past him, you know, you're, you're it's like making your best guess sometimes of how you're raising your kids. And sometimes you're lucky enough to have two, so the mistakes you made on one, you can fix on two. I only had one, so there was, you know, that was it. So... I come to this program, and um, like I said, in July 26, 1992, I'd had enough. And um, I came here, and I wanted what you had, and I was willing to go to any lengths to get it. And I did all the silly little picnics, and I did all the dances, and I did the secretary thing, and I did, I did it all. And I had to do it again, and I had to do it again because I wanted to stay here. You know, I've had, I've lost people in sobriety. I lost my grandmother a couple of years ago, who was my mom. I've gone to jail in sobriety, and I'll tell you this, I don't belong there anymore. Um, I had no shield. When I went there before, I had she you know, don't mess with me and we'll be fine. I didn't have that anymore. The exterior wasn't the same. It wasn't that hard-ass person anymore. That wasn't there. So I didn't, I didn't belong there anymore. I didn't want to be there anymore. And um, it was just a, on something that I hadn't cleaned up before I got sober. You know, I um, I just started to live a spiritual life. And I started to learn what uh, meditation was and finding a God of my understanding. I was raised a Catholic, and, um, you know, I had to make my own God. I didn't want God to be a man. You know, I'd had enough problems with men. I wanted my own God. And so what I did is I chose whoever or whatever spirit brings the sun up and brings it down and brings the tide in. That's enough. That's a power greater than me because I can't do it. I can't do that stuff. So I started getting into uh, the spiritual part of the program. Um, I studied the Course in Miracles for a while. And I did, I worked with others always. And my life started to get better. And, um, you know, I started dating. And, you know, we have this radar, you know, this stamp that says, you know, I'm stupid. And at first, at first, I, I, I picked the same type of men that were out there. You know, that's all I knew. And um, that wasn't working. I recognized very quickly that I didn't want that kind of person in my life today. So I kept, just stayed on my own for a long time. And then I met a very wonderful man. And, and we're married today. And we have a great relationship. And uh, he's helped me through a lot. He helps me when I <laughs> don't want to go to school anymore. And um, in a year and a half, I'll, I'll have completed a dual degree at University of Phoenix. And that's, um, you know, those are my goals. Those are my dreams, to have a good relationship, to have this degree, to um, to just have peace inside. And you know what? This is not always peaceful. You know, I'm human. 
And I don't always practice the principles. I practice them to the best of my ability on any given day. And it's better when I'm in the program. It's better when I'm working it. It's better when I'm here. When I can tell you, come here and tell you what's wrong with me. When I can come here and tell you, I'm all fucked up. And I need your help. And I need you to be here. You know, anytime you can, <laughs> anytime my life's messed up, I run to lie. I live in San Martin. I go to meetings in Hollister. I go to meetings on the east side. But this is my home. You know, I can always come here and count on people to be there, to understand. You know, and it's not that people don't understand wherever, but I've always just felt some, some connection here. And it's a very special place for me. Today, I, um, you know what? I, I really don't want for anything anymore. It's like I don't need this or that. I realize that. I realized a long time ago that it wasn't about the material things in my life. Material things come and go. Jobs come and go. It's about what's inside of me and what I'm willing to give and how I'm willing to open my heart to others. That's what really counts. That's what makes me who I am, my heart. You know, the other stuff are just material things. They don't, you know... I thought, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll get a house. That'll make me feel better. No, well, that wasn't it either. Okay, well, I'll get a motorcycle. That'll make me feel Well, that made me feel pretty good. But, you know, it, 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 the fixes are never going to stay. They're never going to be what you want them to be if you're not growing. And I don't grow unless I'm here. Unless I'm, as long as I'm teachable, then I'm willing to grow. And then I'm willing to um, expand my spirituality. You know, I... Um, I really wanted, um, I really wanted a lot of things in my life and I, I know today that I've received them all and that's a direct result of working in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's a direct result of being what they told me to do in the beginning of this program is willing to go to any length. Willing to go to any length. You know, and I got, my first sponsor was really good at showing me the way in this program. She's, she was very, she is very active in this program. And um, I admired her for that. And, and I wanted to be that kind of sponsor. And I wanted to show what I do as I go through each step individually. We read each step together. That's a pain in the ass. But you know what? I want to give them that. I want to give people what I have been so freely given. I want them to understand that they don't have to live in misery, that you don't have to feel like life is not worth living anymore. Because if life is so bad in here, then what's the difference from outside? You've got to be here. You've got to do something different. You can't come here. You can come here. But coming here and just doing the same old shit is not going to get you anything but the same old shit. And we don't get that in the beginning. You know, like... It was red. You know, we just feel like we can take an easier, softer way. The easier, softer way is AA. It really is. And it's not, um, and you won't know that until you're ready to know that. And then you get here and after a while you think, I'm recovered. I'm cured. So we rest on our laurels, laurels for a while. And what happens is that we get slapped into reality real fast because it's only a daily reprieve. she is there. And I don't like her. And the way I keep her out of, out of your way and out of my way is to stay in this program. I don't need her anymore. I don't need to be angry and hateful and um, blame everything on others. I don't need to do that stuff anymore. You know, I have a wonderful relationship with my mother today. And I never thought I would, I would have that. I hated my mother my whole life because, and I nurtured that. It's like an open wound with salt. You just keep pouring more salt in it. I did that because it was all her fault. If she would only have loved me the way I wanted her, you know, it's like the Cleaver family, but with tortillas and stuff. You know? <laughs> if she would have loved me like I needed her to love me, I wouldn't have drank. You know, and, and I nurtured that. And I used to call her the ice queen, not knowing that I was an iceberg. You know, I, I was just as close hearted as she was. And uh, today, neither one of us are like that. I actually called my mother up not too long ago and asked her for advice. I could hear the, uh, you know, the tenseness of advice. You, you want to talk to me? You know, like she didn't know what to do. And that's a direct result of being here and being with you. There's no other place like it. I've, go, I've been on cruises and found Bill. 
I've been, you know, to Reno, I've been to Tahoe, I find Bill. You can find Bill anywhere. You know, and all the meetings and all the people, it, it's just a wonderful thing. So if I can leave you with anything, it's the book, The Power and the People. It's a recipe that works. You need all three to stay complete and whole. And the alcoholic is always there. It's always going to be there. It's just what you do in the meantime not to drink and not to use. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.